This is the Open University. Welcome to the Open University. Um, if you watched the last couple of, uh, well, if you blinked and missed the last couple of vlogs, you will have missed a lot of exposition of my authorial intentions, which, as we know, don't really matter. What really matters when I make a new record is what it means to you, uh, how it fits into the world. But uh, it also matters what it means to me and what I thought I meant when I was making it. So if you blinked, uh, the last one was 54 minutes, so that was a very long blink. But you missed uh, a thematic guide to the first ten or so tracks. I did two more. I did one about Ozip Mandelstam, the poet, uh, the Russian poet who was exiled to Siberia and died there five years later after criticizing Stalin for having the fingers of worms. History repeats itself because, of course, Donald Trump had to answer charges of having a short, stubby, fat fingers, which uh, was obviously an implication about his penis size as well. Um, uh, didn't send anyone to Siberia, but um, possibly still might. Um, but uh, also there was, um, there was a line in that poem that um, Mandelstam wrote, which was comparing his moustache to a cockroach or to two cockroaches, which I think is possibly even more offensive. If I had a poem written about me, I don't, or a tweet even, you know, I don't think I'd want people to say that I looked like I had cockroaches dancing on my upper lip. Um, so I might very well send you to... Uh, Twitter Siberia for that. I'm sure Trump has, has used Twitter Siberia mostly rather than actual Siberia. Um, I uh, then wrote a song um, which was the final one written for the album and it was called um, Goodbye Mr. Quinn, which uh, actually comes from a detective novel by Agatha Christie. What I did writing this song, well first of all I was going to write a song inspired by one of the lectures of my brother, Professor Mark S. Curry, who's um, a, an acad a real academic. I'm just a kind of fake social media academic and a sort of uh, preening dandy who likes to pass himself off as an open university lecturer for reasons best known to himself. But my brother's the real thing. He is a professor, the head of the English department at Queen Mary College at the University of London, out in the East End there of London. Um, and uh, he has... Uh, he has a lot of books out which are very erudite and rather difficult, um, but uh, certainly on the button if you're into time, memory, verb tense. He's got one called About Time. Um, and there's a couple of YouTube lectures out there which uh, have about the same, interestingly enough, the same sort of viewer stats as my uh, vlogs get, about seven, 800, I think he gets. So the last one he... Um, didn't, he didn't post it, some university posted it. He's very much hiding his light under a bushel, I think. He really avoids social media and most exposure, except for book publishing. But um, obviously he does teach and he does appear to give lectures and things. So there's one very interesting one about retentional finitude. Uh, you can search that on YouTube. You won't find many results. I think you just find one, which is my bro. And uh, he's, um, he's talking about uh, a French philosopher called Bernard Stiegler, uh, and uh, this concept, which relates to ideas that uh, Edmund Husserl, the German philosopher, had about um, uh, anticipation and memory. So uh, in Husserl's terms, that is re retention and protention. Um, retention is the process whereby a phase of perceptual or, or of a perceptual act is retained in our consciousness, in other words, memory. Um, protension is our anticipation of the next moment. I mean, that's, you know, I haven't read to a soul. You haven't read to a soul, I'm sure, but uh, it's out there if you want to read it. Um, and, and my brother has really got interested in how narrative obviously deals with these questions. Narrative is always written after the fact or after an imagined fact, uh, a sort of hypothesized a story, you know, a, a series of facts which uh, you then have to piece together in retrospect or, or one of your characters has to. So my brother's very interested in how verb tense works. And actually... That's a really important factor in the last song that I wrote for the album because I was thinking about it. If you, if you read the lyrics on the newly uh, published lyrics page, you'll see that it's, um, it starts, um, there may come a time when there will be time uh, for, uh, for the will to define Mr. Quinn. Um, 
So it's looking forward to looking back. It's quite a, a, an elaborate verb structure there. There will come a time when there will be uh, a time to look back and define. Uh, so it's looking forward to looking back. And, and, and that is kind of what we're doing all the time as humans. We, we're making our own stories, looking forward to... Often we say, you know, well, how will you feel at the age of 60, 100, whatever it is, when you look back at your life and you say, this is what I did and that's what I did. You're, we're, we're trying to build this narrative by looking forward to looking back. And um, so I put that into, uh, particularly obviously detective novels have this thing about a sequence of events which have to be reconstructed by the detective after the criminal has, has done them. Uh, and, and we have all these possible parallel worlds in which different suspects might have done different things to, to reach the same end result, the murder or whatever it was. So um, it's, it's very interesting as a way of looking at narrative. And so this is what my brother's done. He's got a lot of books about verb tense, and he's very interested in this, the verb tense of what will have, the, the, whatever it is, the future conditional, um, what, what will have been. Um, and that we're, in, in a way, we're living in the will have been. It's funny because in our family, my brother was often teased for um, having a memory which was related entirely to photographs. If there was a photograph of something, my brother could remember it. <laughs> we used to, I don't know why this came up, because he was always, uh, I guess, describing things which were in the family photo album. And we also teased him with being a changeling, oddly enough, because he looked different. He has different... Uh, he comes, I think his genetics come a little bit from the, my mother's brother's side of the family rather than my father's side of the family. So, uh, whereas I look really similar to my father, my brother looks more like my uncle Alan. Um, he's big and rangy and outdoorsy and uh, much more muscular than I am. I'm kind of trying to make a bit of a chest effect in this jacket, but I'm cheating. I'm doing it with a, a, a ball clip at the back. Um, this is just this sort of preening, prancing way that I'm pinned together, but my brother is really knit physically um, like my uncle. So um, the, uh, the lecture is really worth a, a, a look and uh, the most interesting bit in it for me was when he talks about brothers. He talks about something Plato describes in um, Pythagoras which is these two brothers who are titans. Now it happens that I've named myself after one of the titans and the Greek um, gods there are the really old gods who are the titans who are the sons of time, Kronos. And so Momus is the brother of Nyx, who's the god of uh, death, and, uh, and Thanatos is, no, sorry, Thanatos is the god of death. The god of sleep is Hypnos, and Nyx is uh, some other rather sinister god. They're all kind of, it's a really unholy family of negative gods. Momus is mockery and laughter. He's the, the, the most upbeat of that family. But um, So it's interesting already that I've become Momus and that uh, my brother's sort of delving in the same you know, Theogonia by Hesiod is, is the kind of atlas of the, the old gods, the really old Greek gods. And um, so anyway, this is a story that comes up in Plato of the two brothers, Prometheus and Epimetheus. Uh, so he goes back to um, a story which is told by Plato uh, in Protagoras, um, which is the story of Prometheus. And he particularly focuses his study on Prometheus's forgotten brother, Epimetheus. And now Epi Epimetheus, um, in this story, is given a task, which is to distribute attributes to the animals um, um, on Earth. Um, and he does this, but he forgets to distribute any attribute or skill to the human being. <laughs> so he, he is then... Um, uh, Pr Prometheus then objects, uh, he, he comes to check and he objects that, that the animals all have wonderful attributes but the human being has nothing. Um, and it is for this reason, this act of forgetting on Epimetheus's part, um, that Prometheus has to go and steal, he steals two things, he steals fire and he steals uh, the arts um, from Zeus. Um, so Epimetheus is a figure of forgetting. He's a figure of forgetting in several ways. He, in the story, he forgets. He is, in a way, the idiot brother of Prometheus. Um, he is not um, intellectually endowed, um, and he is, by nature, uh, forgetful. He is also, and this is, I think, part of the point of, of Plato's version of this, uh, the forgotten brother. Um, the story of Epimetheus hasn't been told again. 
um, in, at least not in this way. So while he's always acknowledged as a brother of Prometheus, um, his, he is, in a sense, the forgotten. Stiegler calls him the forgotten of metaphysics. So not only is he forgetful, but he is forgotten. And what Stiegler says is that Prometheus doesn't make sense on his own. On his own. Uh, it is only through this double, doubling with Epimetheus um, that, he, that he makes sense. The thing is about him, that Prometheus and Epimetheus, Prometheus always and only looks forward. And Epimetheus looks back, and they're kind of, it's like Jack Spratt and his wife. Jack Spratt could eat no fat, his wife could eat no plain, uh, could eat no lean. Uh, and, and so they, they resolve that by just, you know, exchanging their scraps. But the, the, with this mental deficit of being able to only look forward or only look back, that's a bit more problematical. Epimetheus, although he's not intellectually endowed and he's forgetful uh, and forgotten, he's... Um, He's in a way a symbol of judgment because you can, you need to look back to judge things to make things make sense, just as narrative does in fiction. You're always looking back at events, uh, and he can do that. Whereas Prometheus is always going forward. It's interesting because on, on my album, I, I realised that the one of the themes of this current record is looking forward. It's people having a kind of misplaced and unfounded optimism in the future there's a good time coming, you know, that kind of whole thing, or the Aquarian outlook, which I identify as an Aquarian, you know, my star sign, is, uh, and, and also someone born into that 1960s age of so-called Aquarius. Um, hair is a big reference on the, on the album. All that stuff has marked me very deeply, looking forward to a future which um, may or may not live up to the hype, you know. Um, and, and also, always um, having a... See, my sense, even at the age of 58, is that I still have a glowing future in the arts, which may be true. You know, I'm just, signed a, uh, just about to sign a big book deal with a New York publisher, and that's going to be my next project, is a sort of rock or memoir, which isn't, um, for the next year or so. And uh, so I'm always thinking I'm just on the verge of being famous, but then at the same time, I kind of don't want to be famous. So it's kind of, it's a forward-looking thing. So I really am a Promethean kind of... Uh, a character in that I want that I'm in the arts and I'm I'm kind of interested in the future, but not so much looking back. So I guess I'm writing a memoir is going to be a little against the grain, and I'll probably mess it up, you know, deliberately because I don't really want to do that. But um, it's really interesting to me what, that my brother seems to identify a lot with Epimetheus, the forgotten brother. They're actually twin brothers, I think, if you look in Wikipedia, they're described as twins. Um, and uh, pr my brother says that these two, they sort of need each other. They don't make sense on their own. You, have to, you can't really understand the, the story of Prometheus and why he stole fire and all the rest of it without knowing the story of Epimetheus, who's this, this hidden brother. The other thing about um, Epimetheus is that um, he, um, he is associated with delay. The, 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 the words have been... Uh, the, word, the, the names Prometheus and Epimetheus have been adopted particularly by... Um, uh, philosophy and rhetoric uh, to describe, on the one hand, Prometheus means um, foreknowledge, uh, foresight, and Epimetheus means the opposite. It means after knowledge or after thought. Um, so Prometheus is associated with anticipation, foresight, foreknowledge. Um, Epimetheus is associated with um, afterthought, uh, forgetting and sometimes also, paradoxically, comprehension, the kind of understanding that comes after an event, um, but which was not seen in advance. There he is. I'm revealing my brother on YouTube as the hidden brother and the hidden part of the, the puzzle of my new album, because um, the Mr. Quinn song, which does also, it chops up a lot of detective novel titles from Len Dayton and from Agatha Christie, you know, um, The Cry of the Owl, uh, Double... Uh, Clue, all these things with these titles which come up. It sounds like a Bond theme. It's obviously got John Barry references, but it's also um, a cut up series of detective story titles. There's a poetry all of its own to those, I find. In the context of Plato's dialogue, Epimetheus, the being in whom thought follows production, represents nature in the sense of materialism, according to which thought comes later than uh, thoughtless bodies and their thoughtless motions. So that's interesting, materialism. Um, I guess idealism is, is all about thinking about the future 
and uh, thinking about uh, making models of what the future might be like. But uh, materialism is about dealing with real facts in the real world. And of course, for that, you need retrospect. How did things go in the past? How have things got to where we are now? Uh, history, um, physics, all the sciences and things. So it's a bit more grounded, I guess, the, the, the retrospect. It's more considerate and grounded. Um, I'm kind of I'm kind of looking a bit more poncy now because and I'm being a bit more performative because I'm about to go out in public. I feel like I'm about to launch into Let's Dance. Um, but um, I have a, a, an event this Friday at the Floating University. Here. Was, I'm, I guess I am a kind of academic because I'm performing in a real floating university um, on Friday uh, in which I'm talking about being a returnee from Japan and whether the culture shock is... Uh, is bearable or not, and how Japan has influenced my work in general. And then I fly next week to Scotland. On Monday, I fly to Glasgow. And then on Tuesday, I'm doing a book launch for the new edition of the Book of Scotland. So Tuesday in Edinburgh and Wednesday in Glasgow. Check imomus.com for details. And I'll be doing a couple of musical numbers at those events, but it's mostly to, to launch the book, to sign copies. I hope we'll have copies, finished copies of the Book of Scotland in time. There was some complication with whether the PDF was in CMYK or not. Um, but uh, with any luck, I'll be signing actual copies of the, of the book then. And um, then, uh, yeah, there's just those things. We're missing some curators because there'll be some art event I'll be doing uh, with Alec Finley in the 2019 um, Edinburgh Art Festival as well. So we're, we're talking about where that's going to happen exactly. So I'll be in Scotland next week, and uh, then I'll be in Paris, uh, the Long Night of the Museums, doing a show in uh, the Jewish Museum in Le Marais, and then I'll be in Bologna, or just before that, actually, I'll be in Bologna to do an event in a kind of palazzo in Bologna. So I'm kind of coming out of my hermetic state of... I, you can't really keep up the intensity. Uh, this is why I just do a three-week bash at an album and just totally do that and nothing else for three weeks, because... My ears and my eyes and my body can't really support the intensity of just being so focused and so obsession, obsession, obsessional, <laughs> obsessive, obsessional about something. Um, I think it's a bit like the sushi chef idea that you're kind of um, uh, preparing all year for that intense three weeks. Or it's a bit like, you know, what you hear about Rilke, for instance, the poet Rilke, who's barren for a long time, and then suddenly there's this outpouring. He goes to Duino Castle, and he outpours the Duino elegies. I kind of like to think of it that way. It's like uh, the stuff is building up inside you, and it's important to dam it first. It has to be dammed and sort of repressed and held back a bit and then splurged out. So um, I... Uh, I've already got the, the, the records already up for pre-sale on the Darla site, um, a link below. And um, I'm now going to perform an, a, a little bit. Not very much. I haven't actually done a single concert this year. I've sort of retired a little bit from concerts, mainly because I was in Southeast Asia where nobody gives a damn about my music. But um, I'm then going back into a rather hermetic stage when I get back in autumn from this mini-tour of um, writing the book for the New York prestigious New York publishing company who are, who are very generously giving me the biggest advance of my career, either for a record or a book that I've ever had. So this is uh, allowing me to have the freedom not to do any other work, including concerts, over the next year or so. So uh, the, the, in theory, the manuscript should be finished. The first stage of it should be finished by next summer. And um, yeah, that's, my, that's how things look laid out. Uh, I did this thing yesterday, a stupid thing on Twitter. Somebody said, turn to page 45 of the book nearest to you and the first sentence will describe your relationship. And the first sentence on uh, Anton Naruto, Anton Naruto's uh, anthology that I picked out said something about intermittence, um, uh, which seemed like a pretty good adjective. Intermittent is a good adjective for my love life. Um, anyway, I hope to see you on my travels. I hope if you're in Scotland, you can come along to the um, Fruit Market Gallery. And, or the Glad Cafe. Yeah, my first engagement, well, uh, Berlin Friday, September the 7th, I'm at the Floating University Lilienstrasse, um, and that starts, I think, about 7.30. On Tuesday, the 11th of September, I'm in the Fruit Market Gallery in uh, Edinburgh. That starts at uh, 8 p.m., uh, sorry, 7 p.m. until 9 p.m. It's five pounds to get in, book launch event. Glasgow on Wednesday, the 12th of September. Bologna on the uh, Saturday, the 29th of September. 
at the Palazzo Bentivoglio and Paris the 6th of October in the courtyard of the uh, Musée d'Art et d'Histoire du Judaïsme. And it's uh, part of the uh, Nuit Blanche, which is a, a citywide um, late opening for all the museums. So see you at one of those events. Open University.